Um, yeah. All right. Looking forward to what we have for you guys. Um, Jungian Online connects clients and Jungian therapists and analysts worldwide. Um, please check it out if that's something you're looking for. Um, all three of the folks that are speaking tonight are part of our team. So uh, we're very happy to be able to connect you with them. And you can do that through jungianonline.com. Okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, David. David is a Jungian analyst with a strong background in the arts. He developed a relationship to the unconscious through the art form of contemporary dance. He was a professional dancer and choreographer for 20 years. In 2005, he retired from the stage as a dancer and began a master's in dance. <clears throat> the following year, he began his training at the uh, Ontario Association of Jungian Analysts and graduated in 2012. And you can check him out on our site and davidpresso.com. Uh, Elizabeth Pomez, uh, a member of the IIAP and the Ontario Association of Jungian Analysts, also a member of the College of Registered Psychotherapists of Ontario and the Canadian Association for Psychodynamic Therapy. Uh, she works in both English and French and has a private practice in Toronto. Uh, working with both adults and teenagers struggling with challenges such as anxiety, depression, loss, and grief, difficult relationships, loss of meaning, and life transitions. And she also provides supervision. And we're very happy to be connecting you with all these folks. Um, Alexis Derji has a master's in clinical mental health counseling from Nova Southeastern University. She is a contemporary eclectic Jungian who incorporates emerging social consciousness and integral theory in with process-oriented transpersonal psychology. <laughs> Her foundation is in classical analysis as it is put forward in analytical psychology and she puts strong emphasis on the unconscious and tend to tie this in with current archetypal constellations. And she is currently completing her PhD in clinical psychology at Pacifica Graduate Institute, um, which is where I went as well. And follow her for a lot of good stuff on Instagram at Alchemical Toil. Okay. All right. So here we go. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm leaving you in the capable hands of these folks. And um, David, if you want to start us off. Sure. Uh, well, if we're going to talk about Eros, uh, it's interesting because there's a quote uh, of Jung at the end of Memories, Dreams, and uh, Reflections where he basically says, I mean, I'm going to read the quote here, uh, but there's a bit missing, and I'll talk about the bit that's missing after. So he says late in his life, at this point, the fact forces itself on my attention that besides the field of reflection, there is another equally broad, if not broader area in which rational understanding and rational modes of representation find scarcely anything they are able to grasp. This is the realm of Eros. In classical times, when such things were properly understood, Eros was considered a god whose divinity transcended our human limits and who therefore could be neither comprehended nor represented in any way. I might, as many before me have attempted to do, venture an approach to this Damien, whose range of activity extends from the endless space of the heavens to the dark abyss of hell. But I falter before the task of finding the language which might adequately express the incalculable paradoxes of love. So at the end he does, you know, but I, I believe a little further, he, he, he basically says, you know, but how can we talk about this? Uh, how can we talk about Eros? It's so vast, it's so uh, intricate, uh, basically in so many aspects of our life that you know, it's daunting to talk about this. And well, uh, it's a little bit daunting to talk about this tonight. <laughs> uh, because we, we cannot, we cannot uh, 
say something that applies to everyone or to a concept that also that, you know, is, keeps changing in a way, you know, as he says, it's, it's paradoxical. He has wings, he's somewhere and then, or you know it, he's somewhere else. So just to bear this in mind, I don't know if uh, Alexis and, or Elizabeth want to add to this or a little something to say about that. I guess just to get us kind of going, I'll just, I'll associate. What do I associate to Eros is uh, a pull, really, a, a, of the daemon. You know, when the, when the daemon comes down to us, and I get the sense of that, the pull of that love or the pull of that interest uh, from my psyche is to reveal my shadow and that, that dance that we do together and that evokes a love that I have for process and growth and knowing myself or the archetypal self better. And for mm -hmm. me, I would say, you know, it's, um, I couldn't live without Eros and I know when I live without. I know exactly uh, when I lose the passion for life and when I do some activities deprived of Eros and when I can function with Eros in my life. Whether Eros is for a relationship with a person, with my romantic partner, or in relationship with an activity, uh, anything that I do. So this is, and it, you're right, David, it is daunting to speak about it because it's so much bigger than us. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I'll, I'll read this other quote of uh, Adolf Guggenbull Craig. Now, mind you, it's a little bit of a long one, but I think Gary might be able to put it on the screen here. Uh, because this, I find that this, this view of, uh, of Eros here really helps us to get our mind around what we're talking about here. And he says, according to Greek mythology, Eros is the oldest of the gods, although there are some tales that make him the youngest. Whether oldest or youngest, it is clear that he is a very special God, different from all others. He is the God of love. Here love is understood to include the entire spectrum of emotional attachment, from sexuality and friendship, to involvement with profession, hobbies, and art. Eros is at work in the love which men have for women, and women for men, and I would add men for men, and women for women. Eros is also present in politicians whose love is politics, or in mathematicians whose passion is mathematics, or in flower fanciers who live for their roses. It is to Eros's credit that gods and goddesses, gods and mortals, come together as lovers that new gods and demigods are born. Without him, there would be no movement among the gods. In fact, there would be no gods at all. It is Eros who makes the gods, the archetypes, loving, creative, and involved. Only through Eros can gods and archetypes be loving. As far as we mortals are concerns, concerned, Gods are neutral, inhuman, distant, and cold. Only when they are combined with Eros do we sense the movement, do we become creative, intimate, and stimulating. Here are some examples of what I'm talking about. The warrior without Eros is a brutal mercenary, a senseless mass murderer, a demonic exterminator. With Eros, the warrior fights to defend values which are important to him, ready to lay down his life for others 
and for higher ideals. A trickster without eros is but a common cheat and liar, an imposter, a con artist. With eros, the trickster is surprising, stimulating, not bogged down in convention and routine, but continually revealing new sides of himself and opening unexpected vistas of those around him. He is playful and charming. The mind without eros is overprotective, smothering its children in material security concerned with a selfish extension of the mother herself. With Eros, however, hey, David. child oh, David. love for its own sake. <laughs> hey, David, we're having yeah. some audio issues hearing you um, there. So I think it was starting with the mother one. Was that you guys having the same yeah. problem right now? Okay. I think maybe we're going to be okay now. You want to start from mother again for us? Sure. So I'll repeat this part. So the mother archetype without Eros is overprotective, smothering its in material security, concerned only with food, warmth, and safety. Children are but tools to be used for personal aggrandizement, a selfish extension of the mother herself. With Eros, however, the child, love for its own sake, inculcated ideals, values, and visions. The role of the mother becomes not merely one of biological propagation, but also one of passing on the nurturing and nurturing the spirit of humanity. Well, that's... You sat through all of that. Thank you. No, it was great. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it was perfect. It's a great quote. Yes, and, and I feel that it, it gives us a little bit of an idea of what happens when we're related. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether it's something or someone, uh, when we're related, something happens to us. Yeah. Eros is present, well, something's happening. Yeah, yeah. I think towards the end of that quote, it reminds me of what Von Franz says when she relates Eros to the god that is, or the god of differentiation. When we consider love, and you were talking about the mother, and Aphrodite, if we think about in the Orphic hymn, uh, you know, coming from the sea of chaos and being kind of like an overwhelming love of the mother. And out from her comes Eros, which is a differentiated love. He brings that sense of, you know, selfhood with love and separation with passion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, well, in, the, in the court... Sorry, go have, ahead, Elizabeth. Uh, these three things, loving, creative, involved. And, uh, you know, for me, the Eros is the God of relating, being in relation. And the relation can be very uh, bumpy. But uh, I was thinking this afternoon that somehow it's the, it stands in total opposition to detachment. If Eros is there, you cannot be detached. Mm -hmm. You can be in relation to your partner, even hate your partner, but Eros can still be there and you can hate your partner and you can be in a very uh, vivid argument, but this is not detachment, okay. which right. we suffer from. Yeah, the separation and identity of both equal opposites, but still very involved and related. And, and bringing that connection. And like Jung related Eros and alchemy to the twins and not so much radical opposites, but we're opposites in our similarities. So it, we look in alchemy and Al Jung called it the brother and the sister. So you see your opposite in relation. Uh, mm -hmm. 
but separated. Could you say a little bit more about that? Uh, he, what I was, I was reading about uh, with Jung talking about Eros and alchemy, and he was saying that in love with Eros, we lose everything. We lose kind of all of our whole ground of being kind of take, gets taken out from under us. But it also rejoins us with a new sense of ourselves, a deeper understanding of how we love. Uh, and that we go through that in the vessel with our equi opposite. So it's not like a stark opposite, like the light and dark, but that we both have light and dark, and that in that similarity, we're twins, mm. but differentiated. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, 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 I think there's something to say about, you know, uh, you, you know, the, the myth of Eros and Psyche, it, uh, you know, from the beginning to the end of the myth, a lot happens. You know, it, it begins, and basically, Eros is saying, "You know, I'll be your lover, but you can't be conscious." You know, he, he's kind of saying to to Psyche, "You can't see me, mm -hmm. and if you do, I, I'm gone." Right, and. and and in the process, Psyche becomes aware of herself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I like to think that through the pain that we, or the suffering of our love uh, or erotic relationship, out of the pain, we become a little bit more aware of who we are. It invites a certain amount of reflection. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. I have a I have a quote related exactly to that. If I could read that, sure. Um, that talks about that. Um, okay, here it starts. Um, in Apuleius's tale Psyche and Eros, in which Psyche's last task is her journey to the underworld, we are reminded that the journey of love always involves what Christine Downing called a psychotics of eros. The original meaning of psychosis is I give life. It is those profound chaotic disturbances of love, betrayal, abandonment, loss, and frustration that bring renewed life, new depths of love, and often fuel our creativity. Mm -hmm. mm, fuel our creativity. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if Eros was not present and if there was not pain, we would have much less fantastic poems and pieces of music. Right. Yeah. It, it and less cool. transformation. You know, it does fuel our creativity for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, the, the, I mean, it's amazing to see, you know, how, you know, a young person will you know, have their heart broken and then young, you say? Pardon? I said young, you say? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say they, they'll write their first poem. They, they have never thought of, of, you know, creating anything out of their, out of their suffering, out of their emotions. And out of nowhere, they, they, it just comes out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think there is certainly something about, you know, a maturing eros does invite us to be more creative. I think Hillman says that. Mm -hmm. uh, that fire, it, it becomes a fire of, of creativity. Yes, yeah, so w would you say then that the eros that cannot be lived fully, let's say with the partner, is eros is engaged, is diverted towards another point, and that becomes a poem or a piece of music or movement. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think there, that's one way where, you know, also the 
the lover who's not there or the impossible love, mm -hmm. you know, the imagination is stimulating, eh? Like, since, since object of the desire is not present, it's as if our imagination takes over <laughs> and, and brings us in a state sometimes of obsession. Mm -hmm vis-a-vis -vis the lack. And then when you take something like obsession and you look at how artists can be obsessed, mm -hmm. and, and well, that's fine <laughs> in that realm, you know? An artist who's obsessed about his art, we usually don't have too much of a problem there. Mm -hmm. When we're obsessed about a, a man or a woman, and you know, your friend's kind of like, well, you're gonna get <laughs> it now <laughs> are you going to let go of this eventually mm -hmm. you know eros is you know is he, he brings us into pretty uh dark emotions yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and well, that's where i think we get to the projection of the anima and the animus and the shadow dance that we do with eros when we talk about obsession. Mm -hmm. And when, really, when we talk about Eros, we also talk about libido force and our creative energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the visionary artist is really tapped into that and has directed the, the, the libido energy towards a love that is greater or transcendental that takes us to the transpersonal. Mm -hmm. And that in that space, eros or fanes becomes a manifestation or a transformation. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, Jung is, is, you know, when he describes, you know, in that, that first quote, and I'm just going to repeat this little bit here because I, I find this fascinating. You know, this whose range of activity extends from endless space of the heavens to the dark abyss of hell. And you know, he, he, later he says, Eros will live with us in harmony if we could accept that he lives in those extremes. Yes. Now, for us frail <laughs> human beings, you know, that's pretty... Uh, that's pretty intense uh, God in terms of his range. Well, uh, that's one of the most intense gods. Yes. Because we, we cannot live without love. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's impossible. Right, and love oh. takes us right down to hell. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and to the extreme of happiness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we learn a lot about our own hell and other people's hell. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the darkness of our own shadow. Yes. We learn, we, learn, we learn to love that. And I think that that's what Eros really initiates. Is that when Eros is involved, and without Eros, we can't do that. It's only with arrows that we can pull back our projections and realize what is really going on. And, and we're transformed by that. We learn to love the other in their wholeness and in their shadow. And then we learn to love our shadow. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good time for uh, something. <laughs> a little video? <laughs> yes, there we go. <laughs> You ready for it? Yeah. Sure. There might be a little difference in volume here. Do you remember last summer at Cape Cod? Yes. Do you remember one night in the dining room, there was this young naval officer and he was sitting near our table with two other officers. 
<clears throat> no. The waiter brought him a message. Which point he left. Nothing rings a bell? No. <sighs> well. I first saw him that morning in the lobby. He was, he was checking into the hotel and he was following the bellboy with his luggage to the elevator. He, he glanced at me as he walked past, just a glance. Nothing more. Move. That afternoon, Helena went to the movies with her friend and you and I made love. And we made plans about our future and we talked about Helena and yet at no time was he ever out of my mind. And I thought if he wanted me, even if it was only for one night, I was ready to give up everything. You. <laughs> David, do you want to tell us from which movie? Because I, I, I think that was your selection. Yeah, well, it's from Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, Stanley Kubrick film, 1999. 
And it's interesting because back then, uh, you know, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman were, well, they, you know, they were a couple. It's just before they broke up and he, he used, yeah, pardon? Well, and Kubrick, I think, died just six days after the film was finished, something like that. Yes. It was his, his last movie. Yeah. But anyway, quite, quite the choice, you know, quite the choice of, of actors and who they represented. But I, I like this quote because the paradox in Nicole Kidman's character is so potent. You know, those extremes that we were just talking about of, you know, the abyss and the highest heights of the spirit. This is where Eros likes to live. This, to me, the scene, you know, for sure there's something there of her experiencing. I like when she was mentioning that she would potentially give up absolutely everything, even if it was just for one night. Yeah. We kind of see that in Eros and Psyche in the myth, just give up absolutely everything. Uh, and yet, even in knowing that and in realizing this figure that she saw, she loved her partner that much more. So that yeah. paradox there. Yeah. That's right. Okay. With the sadness, you know, I've I've been watching this uh, several times, and I watched the movie just to get a sense of the the whole thing. I had forgotten about it. What strikes me is it. He seems in a daze. Yeah. He's like, and it's only because of that phone call at the end that it it interrupts it, and you see <laughs> him really trying to come out. And this is fascinating to watch because I think something is crumbling in him at this moment. Everything he thought the relationship was about and that will set him on his path after. But it's fascinating. Well, yeah. well I'll add to this, you know, you know, in the film, Tom Cruise, he says just before, I know you wouldn't sleep with, with anyone else because I know who you are. Yeah. And I think I would rephrase that and, he, and I'd say he knows who she is as, his, as the role of the wife, mm -hmm. the role of the mother, but he does not know the woman. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. like he, he, and she, you know, she obviously knows herself a little bit better than he does because after that, as you said, everything crumbles for him. Everything is apart. Mm -hmm. Tom Cruise character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he really represents for me, I mean, I haven't watched the movie in a while, but I remember him representing some type of uh, an Eros, a dark Eros figure, but very split off. And when we yeah. talk about Eros, mm -hmm. Eros being split and her bringing in this other transcendent Eros figure to kind of facilitate the both of them. She's really trying to get through to him and it would make sense that that would come after him saying, I know who you are. And her being like, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> well, I, I, it's, it, it's interesting to consider, you know, Tom Cruise as a man who's completely identified with his persona. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. He has no idea who he is. Mm -hmm. He's the good doctor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's really love, in love with Aphrodite, like you said, which... Mm -hmm. Uh, brings in, um, I don't know if you guys have read Hillman's Pink Madness, but we think of a split off Eros in that way. And what ha if we look at the different forms of Eros that manifest in our culture uh, in, in darkness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there yeah, is. The, 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 the other thing that uh, I, I find interesting is, is to bring up that this God really demands to be lived. Mm 
Like we can't get Eros. Like, you know, when she says, just to look and then I, what does she say? She's, she can't move. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's possessed her. It's, That's right. we cannot know Eros unless we go through this. And working with people, if, if they haven't lived this in their life, they've had kids, they've been mothers, fathers, they've done a career, everything, and they're missing something. And what it is, is they've never lived the passion where Eros just took them. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me a little bit of like when we do get taken down and sometimes I can relate to this to some of, uh, you know, people in the past that I might have worked with is that that when they do get taken down by love and we have a broken heart and we learn, we come back and learn about ourselves is that that is when we finally start to cultivate that creative fire that we talk about within. And a lot of the times that can open up new vistas for us. Uh, and new new ways of seeing ourselves and the world, and that until we go through that, we it's very hard to cultivate that that mm -hmm. fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So it's like a, it's like the integration process. We we externalize it, and we see it out there, and then we we go down through it, and then we bring it inside, and then we know how to love ourselves and carry it with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And which brings us to greater and deeper loves for the next people that we meet. Greater manifestations of Eros he takes us to. And are there times you think where that doesn't happen after a broken heart? Um, I think that that's definitely, definitely at risk, definitely a possibility. I think there's always a risk of getting stuck, uh, you know, we would say in the underworld and not being able to find our way back. Yeah and decided that we will never love again, for example. Right. And then there's the detachment or there is, this is changed. You know, the, the, the quote from, from Jung about the will to power when Eros is absent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens sometimes when there is such a loss of Eros and we are going through hell. And then we decide that, well, we're not going to come out. And it might be a transformation then into something totally different. So I'm wondering if I could read that quote, which I love uh, mm -hmm. about uh, Jung. Is, would you agree with that? Is that yeah. okay with you? All right. So this is in, um, um, in what is called the Eros theory. It's, um, he says, logically, the opposite of love is hate and of Eros, Phobos, which is fear. But psychologically, it is the will to power. Where love reigns, there is no will to power. And where the will to power is paramount, love is lacking. The one is but the shadow of the other one. And I think this is so true. And we, mm -hmm. we see that a lot. Unfortunately, we see that in politicians, you know, but we, we see that in, in a lot of people where somehow Eros cannot actually follow where it could go. And then it gets diverted into uh, the shadow of Eros, you know, mm -hmm. will to power. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you want to, if you know some people like this, if you want to comment on that. But I think it is a real tragedy in our life really when that happens because it's totally diverted then and uh i mean the thing is we imagine power as you know power and you know uh, I, I, having power over someone but but it's much more subtle to me uh, uh what this means i, I mean I, I like to use this example you know like Two people, they, you know, today, you know, they find themselves on Tinder, they go for a coffee, 
And, and the girl or the guy, you know, they already have their agenda with them. And in the agenda, it's what they want to see in the other person. And if it doesn't fit, it's too bad. We'll just move on to meeting someone else. And the, that's power. You know, this is, this is not meeting someone openly. That's right. Mm -hmm. it, this is, we have an agenda and we say, Eros, you better give me what I want. <laughs> and good luck <laughs> on that. <laughs> Otherwise, stay home. I don't want to see you. If you can give me what I want, though, okay. Uh -huh. Well, that's power. Yeah. This is remind, it's reminding me, is bringing up a lot of things about the therapeutic relationship for me. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, you know, like when you said, when the person is not open and they say to Eros, give me what I want, <laughs> um, I, you know, it just brings up, you know, that power dynamic and thinking about how we can look at the therapeutic relationship in a different way. And where is Eros uh, in therapy? Hmm. Wow. Well, well, actually, Guggenbull Craig wrote an excellent excellent book exactly on this mm -hmm. it's called i think uh, power in the healing profession in the helping professions yeah in the helping professions and and he basically says we have to consistently as analysts check our power mm -hmm. he said as soon as we're not in eros there is no healing that will help happen and I think that also brings to mind, um, have you heard of John Hall's book? It's called The Love Cure. No. Um, it's about um, therapy being erotic and how we, how we, our therapeutic eros and how that's different than, uh, than our sexual eros, but that there's still a lot of er like erotic nature and eros in the therapy room when we can uh, check that power and bring and lead with our heart and lead with arrows. Well, I mean, Jung's, you know, little book on transference, you know, he's got these images and basically, you know, he says the king and the queen, you know, they make love. Now, this is symbolic. Right? It's important to know that in the analytical relationship, love will be there. Mm -hmm. But it has to stay in that relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's no transformation that can happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is much more difficult, I find, to work in a therapeutic um, container and therapeutic uh, relationship when eros is not potent. When there's no eros, well, you it's harder. Yeah. It's, it's harder, it's, it's more work, and it's, it's less opening. It's less really acceptance, compassion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would agree if there's, if there's more eros. And it's interesting because sometimes we, the eros builds as we work with someone and we know we get to know who they are. There's more and more love that yeah. comes into the how how much it contributes to consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's more acceptance, opening to the process for sure. Yeah. You know. Now, there's something that you said, Elizabeth, I just want to say to add, because I think it's really important, you know, when we get our heart broken, I think it's true for some people, it's like never again. Yeah. And we you know? hear that sometimes. Yeah. And, and, and we'll, yes. And, and then it's like, okay, I'm not going there anymore. And, uh, I mean, this is something we'll see in analysis, you know, and mm -hmm. there, there's a, a room in the dream, you know, the house, and there's a room that has been locked, 
uh, that you know we don't there's no there's no even awareness of this room exists <laughs> you know in someone's life and that's right in in that room is is the love that you know basically the door was locked and forgotten mm-hmm. and that well that has to be uh reopened at some point mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah i think the locking of that door is really fear and the resistance to moving through the trauma of the broken heart of what happened mm-hmm. um and in reality we really um depotentiate eros when that happens and he does a lot of his work in our heartbreak and mm-hmm. why he came to us to bring consciousness in the first place. And we resist him at the end when we don't want to move through the heartbreak and get to that higher state of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. There, there's, a, there's a quote, I'm just gonna look for it. There's a great quote. Uh, Sorry to make you wait like this. <laughs> Let me look for it for a second. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and it's a quote by you? Uh, no, it's, uh, here it is. Caro Tenudo in Eros and Pathos. Oh, yeah. At some point he says, we must become aware that though we thirst we yet reject it because we fear it, and so take refuge in the flat banality of daily life. We must become conscious of this bitter and terrible truth. The world does not want love, and it doesn't want to know it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pretty bleak. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, but it is interesting to look, you know, the, the world that we live in, you know, exactly. that it's very easy to kind of desire love, but, but then, oh, no, 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 no. I'm done with that. I, I, I think that in order to find eros, especially we think about what is happening in our world now, it takes work. Like it's like in the myth, in order when, when eros is hurt and uh, flies away, goes away. Psyche has got lots of trials to find him again. Yeah. yeah. So it is work to find Eros again. It's not like, okay, I want it now and that's it. We've got to be participant in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's worth the work because Anyway, I'll talk for myself. It, we can love better. Mm-hmm. And, and this is not a given. That's right. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. I think that for me, that speaks to my experience with Eros and that Eros takes us through those trials and that we eventually learn to love in a real way, a whole, a holistic way, and holding all the opposites together and working through that. And when the passion and the lust go away, that's when the work begins. Mm-hmm. Very true, very true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and do you wanna give folks a little a flavor of what you, you, you each think that work could look like or might, might look like? Well, do you have two or three more hours, Gary? okay let's see well Well, okay um for me it has got to to do with being present to what is and not wanting to change what is which is working with what I have in front of me. If I, uh, like you said, Alexis just said, I want it my way, and if it's not my way, I am out, bye. That's not going to work. And being present and open, for me, it's a question of being open 
to life, to relating to everything. That's the work for me because it's difficult. To stay open. To stay open. Yeah. Well, I, I would say for me, I would agree with all of that. And, uh, but also, we need to mourn the end of our relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we are losing the art of mourning. Mm -hmm. when, when a relationship ends, whether it was for a week or for 20 years, we're going to have to mourn the end. When we love, you know, Eros brings together. Yeah. And when, when this bringing together is not happening anymore and it's, we're apart, well, there's often part of our heart is still with the person. <laughs> There's a great little moment in Janet Winterson's little book, The Passion, where she goes to her lover's house and she says, I want the part of my heart back, please. I cannot walk in the shadows and the alleys of London anymore without my heart. It's beautiful. Um, I think that, um, like we were saying, like when the work begins, um, after kind of we would say the honeymoon phase ends, you know, but we still have love for that person and the work continues, um, that's when we start to do our shadow dance in a more conscious way and we're able to hold each other in our opposites and, and work through certain things that keep us um, from connecting uh, even though we still have love for that person. Uh, and then that process, whether you stay together or you part ways, I think becomes about working with the self and our own projections and learning about our archetypes. And then the whole work opens up <laughs> and there we begin. And I think that sometimes our heart has to break to get there um, in order for consciousness to come back down into matter and into the body uh, and working with the shadow that way. And it's a lifelong work. <laughs> and and it, for people listening too, I, I think it's important, important to consider, you know, sometimes eros is, is an activity. You know, it's, it's something that we do and doing it, we're in a space of love, you know. Uh, you know, like Guggenbuhl Craig says, you know, the flower fancier, he's in love with his roses. Mm -hmm. Like making our life about eros, is, it means we choose the things that they don't necessarily have power, but we respond to it. You know, we, we're, we're a little bit like Nicole Kidman, <gasps> struck by, wow, mm -hmm. love to do this. And when that happens, we really have to pay attention because this, this can make, this can bring a lot of eros in one's life to do these activities that for no other reason, when we're in it, time just flies by. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that brings uh, to my mind awe and the interaction we have with awe and mm -hmm. revelation and we can have awe in the darkness and we can have awe in the light and how we eat, work with that ecologically even, you know, with nature and like you said, the roses, whether that's literal or metaphorical, you know, we are struck by it. We're struck in awe of it. And there's something about it that is of ourself that is us meeting that aspect of ourself and doing that activity, you know, doing art, anything creative, that's kind of what we're doing. You know, we know active imagination and working with the imaginal is about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think we can't really live, we can't really do our work if we aren't struck by the awe of that. Like synchronicity, for instance, you know, that strangely strikes us with that awe and then kind of has the ability to reignite Eros and, and follow, follow the, 
follow the bouncing ball. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I just read a comment uh, saying that it's related to flow. Mm -hmm. you know? uh -huh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And I think when we are not in the flow, we, we are at risk of losing errors. You yeah. know, uh, David, you said, you know, we start an activity and it's like we're in it and we, we've forgotten about time and we dissolved even in the activity. Mm -hmm. And then we are thinking of making something out of the activity or having a goal and being good, being perfect in the activity. And then we lose it sometimes. We lose errors because we have to be perfect. And it's no longer about being with errors in relation with errors. It's about doing and doing it perfectly. And then when we are in the perfection complex, forget about errors, it's gone. Right. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's where power comes in. That's where exactly. that, yes. you know, it is the best. <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I think it, when we're doing that, we're in flow. Flow also represents union. You know, the, almost the drive behind the flow is to unify and that kind of mystical experience of unifying. And kind of Eros is the mediator of that, wanting us to unify with spirit. Uh, and we see that in visionary art as well. Yes, very true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, the, or the whirling dervishes, you know, they lose track of time spinning around in circles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> well, we're going to do some questions. And uh, I invite you to share your questions in the chat. And um, we will relay them. Um, but for starters, I have two little questions of my own. Uh, first one, briefly, for David. And just, you know, you just want to talk about this briefly. How do you, when you're saying folks need to mourn their lost relationships, what does that look like to you? Well, when when we meet someone, there's eros. We'll will be haunted by the image of the person when we initially meet them. Now, this is not something that we create. It just kind of invades our consciousness and kind of go, can I get this person out of my mind? <laughs> can I just get that person out of my mind? And I think we need to pay attention to that. But when, when we mourn, something similar happens where images will come to consciousness, memories, moments, feelings related to the other person. And all we have to do is make space to, for our consciousness to know that this is there. You know, for me, it's walking. I walk, go on walks, and process happens. Mourning can happen. And we don't determine how long it takes. <laughs> Unfortunately, all we can do is know that if these images are coming, well, we're still mourning. If the feelings are still there, we have to pay attention. We don't have to do anything with them. We just have to let them be, at least that, not repress them. So anyway, that's a so, lot about it. Yeah, so both the opening of a space inside ourselves and then the provision of an activity to go with that or I certainly think of something embodied, like you're saying with a, a walk. Okay, before I get to folks' questions, I'll give you uh, my other one. Uh, and just quickly on this one, what does it look like when a therapist is in power and not in Eros? Judgment. Yeah. Judgment. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or telling, telling someone that what they're experiencing is, you know, not right. You know? Yeah, or minimizing what they are experiencing. So yeah. it is, it's the contrary of, of um, 
encompassing the whole of the person. I don't know if it's good English, but it's like no. I am with the person as she or he is. If I'm in power, uh, it's, not, it's not even. I am the one who knows mm. and who's going to say, have a judgment. Or we have an idea of who they should be. Yeah. You yes. know, and we have to consistently let the person reveal themselves. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's to look at them as they are not as we wish them to be. That's power, if we wish them to be something. Mm -hmm. uh -oh, okay, so just as you finished, a question came in. So Pamela says, do we experience Eros naturally as a child and is it lost with life experience? Great question. <laughs> wow. I think it would depend what type of child you were. Yeah. And parents who you had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I don't think that uh, it's, it's an archetypal energy. We don't, we don't lose it. You know, like we might lose the connection to it, but it's still there somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think we get to know it better. You know, we come into greater union as we separate and come back to it as we get older. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, yes, we don't have it as a child for whatever reasons. And then it visits us, it comes upon us as we experience life further. So mm -hmm. it's not that we lose it, it's always there, I agree with you. It's always there and sometimes it just needs to be uncovered. You need to lay the, the land so that it can appear again, you know? And, and, and you know, uh, to add to this, you know, and this might be helpful so for people to, to grasp is that Eros, you know, it, it's got wings, you know? This is a God that wants to be free. Mm -hmm. When we put it in a box, when we say, okay, now I'm married, no more desire. <laughs> well, you're putting Eros in the box. I I'm going to live a religious life, so no more Eros. Okay, well, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, I think it gets transformed into a difference. The, the mystic experience, it becomes sheer internal, and you don't get to experience it in, in the other which is where we kind of learn the most about ourselves. Well, you see, to live it in one sphere, if we live it only in a spiritual fear, I mean, then we're completely denying its connection to the body, mm -hmm. to feelings, and also to fantasy, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's part of our wholeness. We can't just fragment our experience you have to take the whole thing or or suffer the consequences actually and also i think like uh in the psychoanalytic perspective we would say uh like patricia berry at pacifica says that the child is polymorphous and that there's always eros there everything is eros and we can't differentiate um the child is very oral you know, there's a lot of fantasy that's involved, but as we grow up, that fragmentation starts to coagulate into a more mature, holistic view of Eros. And as we go through the different stages of re-meeting Eros, as he becomes more conscious to us. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, something from, I would like to comment on it, it's from Donna. And that's a, when she, she says, beauty in all its forms stimulates Eros. And I find that so true. And you see, in order for us to be receptive to beauty, we have to have a certain relationship to time. Like, you know, if, if you are in a hurry to go somewhere, beauty escapes you. 
you know, you have to actually slow down in order to be present to beauty and eros. You know? mm -hmm. If that is not there, uh, eros is more difficult to find. Uh, I'm just going to check here. I think it's Chris that says, you know, there's a connection between Eros and arrows, <laughs> like Nicole, when Nicole Kidman was stunned and struck dumb. As well, well there is also uh, the idea of in, in the psyche Eros myth, there is a wound. Mm -hmm. oh, it's like when often we'll see this in dreams, you know, the, the dart, the, the, the little, the needle, you know, in someone's calf or something and often it's the eros it's symbolic of eros having hit us but also you know like nicole kidman this experience changes her consciousness she cannot go back to being the good wife and the good mother and, and you know at the end of, of the film you know, she, she affirms this. It's like, we're not going to go back. <laughs> she says to Tom, we have to be here now. And we have to be intimate. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think it's a good point. You know, Eros has arrows. And when we're, you know, struck by one of these arrows, chances are, well... Our consciousness might change. Our view of the world might change. Mm -hmm. And it is true that we cannot go back to a, a more limited aspect of who we were. We have been changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The regressive restoration of the persona. <laughs> <laughs> which Tom Cruise would, I think, in the film wants to make happen, you know, he, he wants to go back, you know. Mm -hmm. and she's like, no, no, <laughs> we're not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. There's a, a point I wanted to just get into when you're talking about the attitude towards time and in connection to this. Um, for me, one of the really interesting things about the anima is when there's a full blown, you know, real strong sort of fall in love connection with the anima. In my experience, that's something that makes the woman kind of timeless for the man. It, it makes her eternally the same age, regardless of how she has actually aged. Um, and you know, th th there's a magic to that romantic connection there that, that sustains over a great deal of time, you know. I think that that's bringing to mind something that I was reading earlier about how Eros is one of the primordial gods and that when we interact with Eros takes us right down to the beginning of the archetype and so when eros is struck by the anima or when the anima is involved with that erotic interaction that and we lose track of time uh we are almost like we are pierced and take taken right back to the core to the archetypal uh or primordial nature of the archetype and remembering all of love of all of history <laughs> Alrighty, so if there's any more questions, just put them in the chat, but I think we're getting close to wrapping up here, guys, so let us know if you've got something you want to say. Please, perhaps just one question. Uh, Donna says, what about in saints such as Avila, where it was internal, and the, bo and the body, maybe there's something else after that, I don't see. Well, Saint Avila was in love with John of the Cross. Mm -hmm. 
and that's where we see her arrows. They, they, we don't know if they actually met up. People can correct me. Um, but that was their, their, the church and the monastery was like their container. But they had a madness that they shared together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was that a lot of passion in her. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this is of a different note, but maybe it's it's good to mention too. Is, is that the way we live our relationships has changed quite a bit uh, in the last fifty years? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. yes. In, anyway, in North America and Europe, people don't get married as much as they used to. Religion used to be, had, had a whole hand on our relationships, actually. Mm -hmm. This was comforting because then the paradoxical nature of Eros was kind of, well, it goes up to here and, you know, you better not pass that limit. And now we're faced with no one really can tell us the way to live our relationship. It's for us to create them. Make them fit who we are as two people together. And I often get, you know, people telling me, well, we ought to be like this. Well, no, <laughs> you don't ought to be like that. <laughs> That's, you know, you've, you've seen too many Hollywood films. You've, you, you've seen too many romantic, you've read too many romantic books here. You know, it, it, this isn't what it's about. And it's your creation. You make, and this is daunting, because no one's going to tell us, no God's going to tell us, this is wrong. You're not living your relationship well. You know, our friends might want to do that, or people <laughs> or family. <laughs> you know, our mother, father, well, you know, you ought to live it that way. This is not right. Well, Right now, where we are at this point in history, it's kind of new territory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you might have even to unlearn some automatic behaviors mm -hmm. in order to create, you know? Very, yeah. very good point. <laughs> out of your relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have to be conscious. Yeah. Very good point. I have a book here that I was looking at that kind of speaks to that. I have to get in at least one book recommendation, <laughs> uh, but it's called uh, Eros and Chaos. Is it backwards? But it's by Veronica Goodchild and it's called The Sacred Mysteries and Dark Shadows of Love. So speaking to the times now, you know, we are in a lot of chaos, but it talks about how to integrate that. Uh, into our experience with Eros and how sometimes the chaotic nature of love is, is, the, is the core of it. Can you give the title again? Do you mind? Yeah, it's called Eros and Chaos. It's by B Veronica Goodchild. She was from Pacifica and it's called The Sacred Mysteries and Dark Shadows of Love. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, it, it occurred to me that um, you know, we were talking about that, that moment uh, after the heartbreak and whether that can turn to bitterness or to growth and salvation. And so many of our films and movies that the villain is formed in that moment. Well, Bram Stoker's Dracula, I mean, lots of other ones. Okay, so we got one question. Could you talk about other strategies or ways to conjure arrows? Okay, conjure. I have a question for my English. Conjure means what? To, to make it happen? Bring into being, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think I would say working on yourself, but ultimately, Eros is going to find us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, people say, you know, I want to meet someone that, you know, often my suggestion is go do an activity you love yeah. and 
get involved in that activity and hopefully there's other people involved in that activity yeah. and it's good to already be in eros <laughs> yeah. absolutely yeah yeah mm -hmm. Well, and, and to me, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I think we should to, you know, address this question a little further, if you guys want to add to that, um, you know, your ways of conjuring arrows, the other two answers, but I think, um, should we do that first? <laughs> Go ahead. How to conjure arrows? Well, I, I am totally in agreement with what David said, you know, it's like, you you need to be in eros yourself first you need to then go and be in, a, in an activity and meet somebody organically so it's it's not going to i'm not sure if going to a bar to meet somebody might work if you like to go to a bar but you would be much better to um to go and do something that you love Mm -hmm. And then it will be a meeting. You will come into resonance with somebody. And then that's Eros. Yeah. Because as you say, Eros has got wings and can go whenever, whenever he wants. You know? You're not going to just put your, your hand on him. It doesn't work that way. Like, like you say, Alex, he chooses you. Yeah, yeah, I think it's important to, um, to remember yourself but i think that ultimately when we talk about eros we really can't conjure eros eros comes to us you know and and my my balancing out of you know finding the good eros you know if the question is what type of eros are you looking for um is to get in trouble <laughs> mm -hmm. well, to add to that you know I, I think when eros you know i think we have to pay attention to our relationships <clears throat> you know that sometimes we do meet people that actually touch us and there will think will we won't necessarily make something of it right away sometimes you know like the french word coup de foudre you know food, which is you know like you're struck by love well, sometimes it's not like that, but sometimes it's like you go to the coffee shop, I like to use this, this example, you go at the counter, the person serves you, you say, hi, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. You leave. And then the image of that person keeps coming up for no reason. And that, that you have to, well, go back to the coffee shop. <laughs> Little things where, you know, sometimes we don't pay attention and there's little sparks of eros in our meeting with people. Now, it doesn't have to be the love of your life it can become a great friendship, you know? And, and you know, if you're a, a, a straight man and you meet another man and you get a little bit of eros, doesn't mean you're gay. But it might mean that you have a really good connection with this guy. It's worth exploring. It's got, Eros has got to be lived. We got to go see. Be curious. Be curious, yes. Very good point. Mm -hmm. And with that, I would say you can also conjure, conjure Eros by going to therapy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that I think that people, I mean, and this is what I tell my friends when they're looking for a therapist, you know, that person is someone you're going to be very close with. So, you know, think about that when you're choosing a therapist. It's not necessarily read off this and that and the other in their resume. Take a look at the person's picture even mm -hmm. and say, you know, how do I feel? Is this, is this going to be, you know, you know, and of course me too, but I think that's the way to think about it, um, that it's going to be a relationship. Yeah. You're going to share your deepest secrets with this person and get very close. So, you know, and, and how different uh, an approach that is to a clinical, yes. you know, <laughs> definition of what we might say we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Good point. Pardon? Good point. Yes, good point. You know, we have to listen when, when we meet someone on a, you know, and when we're there, you know, like, do I like to be in this person's company? Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but this is true also when we go out on a date, you know, a lot of people, it's kind of like, well, how was it in the presence of the person? Was it enjoyable? What would, were you afraid? <laughs> you know, well, sometimes it's okay to be a little bit afraid, not too much, but to kind of go, ooh, I feel so much that I'm, I'm a little bit scared. Well, yeah, Eros is, <laughs> when it's there, well, it's a little bit scary. That's okay. And I mean, to me, just that it's very clear to me that on some level, there's a connection to very close to something that we're talking about here with Eros to the Tao and to being in authenticity in the world. And, you know, I, I uh, saw a quote at some point in the last year that was saying, you know, don't go looking for love, go looking for life and love will find you. And I think that's kind of the energy that we're talking about here, which is, you know, if you can move through the world with authenticity, including Eros, um, you know, then it, and, and openness and all that, and it might find you. Yeah, okay, I could say more about that. <laughs> well, you know, the beloved loves us who we are, and Often we, that's hard to believe that we can be loved just the way we are. And that's love. If we're loved because of what we've accomplished, and that, that's not love. Yeah, that's so true. Which means like, you know, <laughs> the good and the bad sides are going to be there. You know, we go on a date and we think, okay, here's a nice persona for you. Well, as much as we can, we have to be able to be who we are, even if our persona is there. It has to, you know, who we are has to transpire through our persona, be accessible. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I'm thinking of. It's just something random, it might not be related, but it just came in about, like, we have to lose ourselves in order to find ourselves. Yes. And that is the function of arrows. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's so true what, what you're saying. And, you know, to lose oneself, I mean, we see that in Nicole Kidman, in the, in the uh, excerpt, but in the language, in several languages, you fall in love. Same yes. in huh? So I, there's, there's a sense of um, demantelment, I don't know how to say that in English, uh, dismantlement of, mm -hmm. you know, even sometimes dismemberment out of, with errors, we lose who we thought we were and something else emerges. Mm -hmm. Like Osiris putting his body back together. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, like, <clears throat> I like to hear, you know, someone say, I can't believe what's going on. I feel like an adolescent and I'm, you know, 40, 50 years old. Well, I can't, I'm acting like an adolescent. So what? <laughs> Eros is an adolescent, you know, it's like you're going to feel like that for a bit. That's okay. But, you know, it's our power, our concept, our conception of who we are might not permit that. And even, you know, Eros as child God also is about play. And this is what we're talking about, the authenticity of authentic play and being with someone in a playful, real engagement. Mm -hmm. Play is a good thing. Yes. You know, we lose the rules. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
All right. So speaking of losing the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Good segue. <laughs> it's probably time to wrap it up, everybody. So thank you. I think this was just fantastic. And, and I want to thank you, Elizabeth, Alexis, David, for sharing your time with us very generously. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, Elizabeth, Alexis. Uh, it was great. It was fun. Thank you. Yes, there was a lot of eros going on. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay well you're getting lots of thanks in the chat so you guys can feel free to, <laughs> feel free okay. to enjoy that before i close things up okay thank you very much <laughs> you're, you're welcome thank you and bye, um guys. pardon i said bye guys <laughs> i'll see, I'll see you. <laughs> I think um, a few of us are going to see each other in real life pretty soon, so that'll be fun. So, great. Yeah. Okay. okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you.